the value proposition you have to offer and the way in which you offer it is just, it just requires way more like finesse and thoughtfulness than, than I think we had in web two. It's more like, Oh, what is the, what are we actually offering people here? Don't just build something people want, build something people want to be a part of. And that feels like the real distinction between web two and web three marketing as well. Welcome to W3G, the official podcast for Maya and XYZ and your go-to hub to learn the latest developments in growth and marketing in the wild and wonderful world of Web3. I'm Julie Octaviano, Head of Accounts and Operations at Maya and XYZ. And I'm Blake Minho Kim, co-founder of Myosin XYZ. Each week, we'll talk to leaders in the Web3 space about the state of the industry, what they're building, some interesting growth hacks, and best practices around all things Web3 marketing. W3G is a place to learn and get smarter in public, not only for those of us already in the space, but for the Web2 brands that are curious on how to transition over. We're all building together in this crazy space. So tune in each week as we talk to the best and brightest and keep uncovering insights so we can all grow together in the world of Web3. Today, we'll be speaking with Steph, head of media at Seed Club, a leading seller in Web3 and founder of Vessel, a brand new on-chain media platform for brands to engage and grow with their biggest fans. Steph is a brilliant media and marketing mind, having built out Seed Club's media organization over the past two years and now embarking on her own founder journey to create more delightful on-chain consumer experiences. If you're interested in on-chain media and distribution, this is the listen for you. So without further ado, let's get into it. Here's episode number 15 with Steph. All right. Uh, thanks for joining us on the pod, Steph. How are you doing? I'm so good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I'm really excited for this conversation. I feel like like we've been talking for a while, and obviously, you know, for my and like we were in Seed Club, and so it's been fun like working together there. But it's always good to just kind of have that one to one conversation and just learn a bit more about you as an individual, what you're working on, and all the cool things coming up. So. Let's get into it. So I guess to kick things off, every episode, we like to start with a good origin story. So <laughs> let's talk about that, right? Overall background, where did you first hear about crypto, this Web3 thing, and how that all come together to bring you to where you are today? Totally. So I uh, come from a like liberal arts background, went to NYU, thought I was going to be a journalist, but then that dream very quickly died. I, I graduated in 2011, so basically mid, mid sort of like early post recession. And yeah, I actually, I, I went into um, farming for a little while. I was a, I was a goat farmer, like managing dairy goat farms and actually ran. Yeah. And actually ran all the um, like content and like branding for these um, yeah. Farmstead creameries. So like, you know, bougie cheese that they'd sell in New York. And it was kind of like where I taught myself the like mechanics of what makes things sell and like how you tell a good story. And, but yeah, that, that was something I did right after college. Um, and then yeah, kept, kept on going and, uh, diving deeper into the world of branding and storytelling. And right before I onboarded to crypto, I was running my own boutique branding agency. So from, yeah, from, from field to, I don't know, field to (laughs) computer. Uh, but yeah, I, I first, heard about web three from an a 16 Z episode on NFTs. I was an actually, and actually, no, no, I'm going to back that up. The real first time that I heard about crypto and got interested was actually a proof, um, a Kevin Rose conversation with Mike Shinoda. And he was talking about his, yeah, I don't, I don't know if like anyone listened to that. Uh, Mike Shinoda was building on Tezos and, you know, I had listened to Lincoln Park. Growing and, up and, and just some quick backstory for, for anyone who may not be aware, right? <laughs> Mike Shinoda, Lincoln Park, as you were about to say, Lincoln like Park. OGs, like they were doing, yeah. I don't know, like. Cypher, not cypherpunk, but like I remember those music videos were absolutely insane back yeah. in the day. They were doing like CGI stuff. They were on it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much like like dystopian, like future internet vibes in the mid Um And yeah, so, so I was interested in Mike Shinoda's story and I was like, oh, this is like someone who I respect and have had like relationship with in, in music. Um, so that was like kind of my entry point. And then I listened to an episode on NFTs through the A16Z pod. Yeah, in 20, fall 2022 or 21, sorry. And But the thing that actually made me like go all in was um, when Jack Dorsey stepped down from Twitter because <laughs> he like, and, and he went, you know, all in on on crypto after that. And I was like, okay, if this guy that like 
people have been trying to get to step down from his baby. The thing that finally gets him to step down is crypto. I like should probably start paying attention. Um, so thank you, Jack Dorsey. And yeah, it, that was in that was in fall 21. And yeah, Seed Club was kind of the, one of the first DAOs that I bumped into. And yeah, the rest is kind of history. Here I am. Amazing. Let's dive into, I guess, Seed Club and your journey there. How was that journey? What did media look like? What does marketing look like? What was that experience like? And so let's start there. Yeah. So I joined, I officially joined the C club team in February of 22, just as like part-time. And I'm still in the process of shutting down my, uh, my previous branding studio. And I came on to just like support content, like creation, and then eventually ended up taking over the Twitter account. And then in April of 21 came on full-time and really started to build out the, the media efforts there. So previously there wasn't there wasn't really a specific media strategy. wasn't really a social strategy, and and not as a, like a knock on the team. It's just like when you, if you don't have someone on the team who's thinking about it specifically, it typically gets um, put to the wayside. But yeah, so I I started you know looking around. I was like, there's so many stories just like waiting to be told here, and um, how can how can we tell them in the most like linguistically and, and like visually compelling way? And so at the time, uh, worked with uh, the the rest of the team there, and yeah, started started building out a, a meaningful like media and content strategy. And then in July, came on even in like an even greater role as the sort of like yeah head of head of media. Um, and so then we had a proper media team at that point because you know back then C Club was really operating uh, in this. Uh, we had like we had working groups, and it was during the time when there was like all this attention on, you know, sort of bounties and like, you know, uh, permissionless contribution. Uh, and so the, the organization and the contributor base was just, was really wide, um, you know, very classic, like bull market, um, situation. Uh, and so we had a, we had like a proper media working group and yeah, it was, it was really fun to, to take what I thought I understood about media and web two and like apply it to media and web three. And then very like in quick succession realized that it was like not a, a one-to-one analogy. And, and that was like super exciting to figure out, okay, how can we, how can we create a, a like meaningfully crypto native media strategy? And I feel like we're still figuring it out. You know, we all are. Yeah. I actually on that, I would love to know how you've seen, I guess, two part question, how you seen like seed club, evolve over time. I I don't know exactly how long you were there, but like, I would love to like kind of hear the journey of when you first started there and how it evolved, especially with your contribution as, you know, head of media, as you, um, as you stated, and then also just in general, like favorite media growth marketing tactics that you use to promote Seed Club during your time there. Totally. So yeah, by the time when I onboarded in winter of 22, C Club had been around for like a year ish already. They had done, let me think, three cohorts at that point. And yeah, they're definitely like, you know, C Club had had a pretty significant Twitter following, you know, that we like we had been, we were like a big presence in a certain like corner of the space already. But one of the things I noticed in, you know, I, I like went real deep on Twitter analytics uh, for a minute just to get a sense of, uh, to, to build a little bit of a story about the success of our of uh, our media efforts and the thing that was the thing I noticed was like yeah the prominence of C Club's Twitter uh, which really was the sort of like entry point for most people and then the podcast then took that place um, but it was really a story about the the bull market that people like there was just like in really crazy hockey stick growth in our follower count on Twitter, even though like no one was posting, like there was like no actual strategy. It was just like, people were just trying to follow as many crypto native um, companies and orgs and DAOs as possible. Um, So uh, when I came in as head of media, I came in like, as that was really starting to significantly slow down. So that was kind of tough because the, the like on the surface story was that our like media efforts were quote unquote ineffective, but really what it was is like, oh no, we're just in way different like market and zeitgeist uh, conditions than, than previously. And yeah, you know, we, we had our most successful podcast season in the fall. So it was when we shipped season three of uh, the C club podcast, which we rebranded to building at the edges. So previously it was just called club pod and it was, yeah, it had, it had had, uh, two seasons by that point. But so for season three, we like 
re-upped our strategy altogether. Um, we fully rebranded the podcast. Um, and we, we instigated like a, a more dynamic media strategy. So using every podcast episode as, um, as like the anchor content, but then creating, you know, multiple Twitter threads that would come out of that. We would do a newsletter for each one that dropped and we would have, you know, video shorts, um, and audiograms that would come out of it too. So we felt like the, basically giving the content legs to, to be able to spread over time. And yeah, that our, our metrics for that season were like 30% higher, like season over season. than it was like our most successful season and, and our opening our, our like inaugural episode with Marty from pool suite, just like through the roof numbers, um, which is so exciting because it, it, it felt like it had come after like the slog of just like trying to use to, to showcase like through metrics that like, yes, our media strategy is actually working. And so that, yeah, that, that felt like a, a real win. Basically, yeah, taking a, a piece of anchor content and building an intentional strategy around it and then replicating that for every episode that we published that week. And then, of course, there were all these like operational backend stuff that I find really juicy that were just really supportive for us too. Another thing that we've started doing for this season of the podcast is doing um, proper prep sessions. So basically just doing like a 30 minute prep with every single guest within like the, within 48 hours of having them on has been, a, has been a huge uh, boon for the conversations and and for the, the guest prep. So that was something that, you know, it, it's like, oh, another meeting, another thing to schedule, but we felt like it really supported the flow of the conversation. Sounds very familiar, right, Blake? <laughs> Everything <laughs> yeah. about what she just said about, you know, creating content out of that podcast and giving it legs and having it spread over uh, multiple channels and, and time beyond just that episode. I am curious not to like spend too much time on, on this question or topic, but since I am head of ops and obviously Blake is very um, heavily involved in ops at Myosin, what some of those like juicy back end ops things that you mentioned were that you felt like really made a difference in your role or just like overall success of, of Seed Club during your time there? Yeah. I mean, we made use of Notion like wild. Like, <laughs> like we went all in on Notion. We just like created the bespoke content management system. Like I feel like even in, even prior to web three, like I had attempted to find editorial calendars, like templates and it just, I always ended up just making my own version of it, like in Google Docs. So yeah, we basically powered through a bunch of different iterations, especially uh, in Notion, especially because we were working with myself. We had like basically a, like a social media manager, Tina Yip, incredible. First of all, just like human strategist. We had a, you know, a podcast editor who would, pro- who would do all the posts. And then we also had a designer who would produce all the visual assets. So there were four of us in the team that were, that we were trying to coordinate around. And so that was, yeah, we went all in a Notion and built our own like custom uh, like media management system and and then also just booking as many guests as possible in like a three week span. We just kind of like hit Jess. We're like, all right, you're gonna do like three interviews this week. Cause one of the things that and I'm sure you can relate to this and you know, and, and Blake too, especially me like pushing this this podcast recording back a few weeks. But yeah, just like scheduling is just the worst. Like <laughs> it's and it can be so stressful when you're trying to ship something weekly. So yeah, just like really pushing to like get all these interviews Heard. bucketed. <laughs> Heard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And Jess was, you know, at the time Jess was like, this is really a lot of interviews. And I'm like, totally. But like, think about it. We're going to power through this and then you're going to be, you're going to be scot-free for a couple of weeks and we'll do it again. And yeah, that was a real, a real unlock. Wow. I love that. And, uh, I can, yeah, everything Julie's saying, we can relate. I think it's like when you're trying to ship something weekly and, and scheduling yeah. is, uh, I, I mean, just pulling back the curtain on our, our end a little bit, like I have this, we're chatting right now. We have a webinar this afternoon and then we have another recording like tomorrow. So like to even this Ooh. week, we just have three, three in two days. And, and already that, you know, we have a lot of other stuff we have to manage. So it's, it's a lot, but it's worth it. Cause again, yeah. you can kind of just feed that over time. And then, so I guess kind of like bringing it back to like the podcast, what was, I guess with seed club was the kind of like primary KPI kind of like driving applications, driving kind of like overall awareness. And then what were the kind of more specific, um, I guess, tactics? Was it all, like you said, was it all built around the pod and then using the newsletter and chunking up content? That was the main 
uh, strategy? Yeah. So we, so within the media team, we basically ran four um, verticals. We had social, um, we had productions, which included the podcast. Um, we had brand, uh, and then we had editorial. And at any given moment, we would like dial up certain like focus on the specific vertical. So like last fall, when we were running season three of the podcast, we like kind of dialed down editorial. Whereas like in the summer and spring, we were like dialed up editorial a bit more. But yeah, we saw, you know, I, I was using monthly listens for the podcast as my primary KPI. I also was doing total downloads on uh, on launch day for the podcast as another KPI. And yeah, and, and like really clear response in in the in those numbers as we increase the amount of follow-on content that we did for every episode. So that was like a little bit of a like, well, duh, of course, like the more, the more like, you know, you put out there, the more people are going to drive back to the episode. But it was just really nice to see how clear of a line that was back to it. And yeah, so we yeah, focus primarily on the podcast. The the sort of call to action or why, why, why create content? Um, for us, it was like, you know, brand awareness always, but then depending on where we were in an accelerator cycle, we would have different things we were trying to optimize for. Right. So getting as many applications as possible would be one of the things we'd optimize for during an application period. We actually had a really successful application period for our uh, fifth accelerator. So the batch that uh, Myasin was in, we ran weekly Twitter spaces for like four or six weeks leading up to applications from the time applications opened to the time they closed. Those were great. It was also a way to get more other team members involved in the in the like media component of it because really Jess has always been like kind of the face of C Club and oh, last year when we were we were really had just like way more contributors uh, we wanted to bring as many people to the front of the the brand as possible so that was a great way to to involve um, Myrna um, she got like to try her hand at at being a spokesperson and and also like just talking about her expertise as like basically running um, the sort of back end ops of the accelerator so we did Twitter Spaces once a week and we also did uh, we did like a launch party on Twitter spaces for the accelerator application period and then we did a announcement party on Twitter spaces as well for once we were announcing the cohort and so you know Twitter is a very different place than it was last summer so obviously that marketing strategy doesn't quite apply one to one but I think I think the lesson there is like giving people a place or a chance to come and feel like they're in the room with the brand at a regular basis was I think that's the biggest takeaway there so then and yeah we actually maybe this is kind of interesting just to get into tactical stuff. So we would run the accelerator like a full-on campaign and we'd have different segments for the campaign. So we'd have like the application period, we'd have the selection period, we'd have the actual accelerator period, and then we'd have the demo day period. So for each of those periods, we had different things we were trying to optimize for. So, you know, during applications, it's obviously getting in as many applications as possible. During selection, it's just like trying to keep the brand top of mind so that people would pay attention for the cohort announcement because we want to bring as much visibility to the cohort members as possible. And then during the accelerator, it was really pushing out the insights that were happening in real time, like basically showcasing how powerful this accelerator is and positioning Seed Club as a place where high insight conversations and really incredible builders come to build. And then for the demo day period of the campaign, it was really like just get as many people to show up for demo day. And so that was really supportive in building out a marketing campaign. It's like over the course of this, um, you know, five, five month period, there's like four distinct, uh, four distinct segments that have different things you're optimizing for, which means your content has to be slightly different. Your cadence has, has to maybe be slightly different. And then also your visuals and your copy, like all of that kind of chunks up into whatever your goal is for that specific segment of the campaign. That was really supportive for us. And we also had our most, yeah, our most successful demo day. I think we had like over a thousand RSVPs and yeah. And, and demo day was great. You know, we did it on, we did it on a combo zoom and discord. So yeah, that was, it was, it was, hugely successful and from from where we sat on the media team for those who, who may be listening who aren't aware i mean myas we we were part of the fifth cohort last december and i think the reason we applied in the first place was i had met someone through cafeteria dow i think yeah and so i met him through some group and we met in new york he's like you should check out c club and then uh, I showed up to demo day and I was like, what the absolute, like, this is insanity. Because for those who may not be aware, like C-Club's demo days are legendary. Like just the amount of emojis and responses and like online yeah. love, like I'd never seen anything like that. I was like, there's something here. And honestly, that's kind of why we applied. And so, nice. yeah, yeah, kudos to you and the team. So you guys are crushing yeah. it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, the, 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 um, SEO five, the fifth cohort demo day, you know, Twitter basically broke that November, uh, when, when Elon took over and Twitter has always been our <laughs> primary distribution yeah. channel. And so I was, I was really stressed about trying to make sure we filled the room because yeah, suddenly our primary distribution channel just like blew up and just like did not work. Like I look at the metrics from November and our like follower increase, our like impressions, they were all down to like, you know, pre bull market 21 vibes. Like they were so low. So I was a bit of a panic. So I think the fact that we were able to secure as many RSCPs and also to get as many people in the room as possible just felt like such a win for, for the team. Yeah. And it was like, I just like kept you know, patting the whole team on the back. I was like, we we're doing, we're doing it. Like people are showing up. This is good. Like we got it. Epic. Epic. Yeah. So I guess we can just transition over to like more of a high level marketing view to stay true to the format of this podcast. So I think like as a web three marketing podcast, and I'm sure maybe you can relate to one question that we get all the time is what is the difference between Web3 marketing versus Web2? So I'd love to hear your take. Like, how do you approach that question? What does it mean for you specifically within the context of media? I think I'm actually would, I think I would start with like, what is the thing that isn't different? Like, what's the thing that still remains the same? Because it's, it feels like such a pain, yeah, such a pain point for me all the time is, you know, getting, getting quote unquote, like, I'm going to use this very dirty phrase, first party data, it still feels like, it still feels really important, right? That it's still really important to have direct connection to the audience and the community that you're trying to build. That, that remains a constant. Um, and maybe we'll come back to what that actually looks like in web three, but yeah, what, what is, what is different? So, so, you know, in web two, the way I would approach mar marketing is like your end goal is basically to have someone take a very simple action, whether that's to like click, whether that's to make a purchase. And so the, the marketing, uh, and, and I'm, sh I'm sure that there are some like marketers who are going to come after me for saying this, but it's just a bit more, it's just a bit more passive, right? You're just, you're doing a lot more of like pulling people along and like AB testing one word or colors to just try and get people to click. And it just got so, I felt so tired of it. <laughs> and so, yeah, in, in web three, like there's this real clear distinction between, and, and it is in, in web two in some ways too, but like the, the distinction between like audience and community. Right. And we're, we're exploring this with broadcast right now. It's like, what is, what is the thing that you're actually trying to um, design for here? And like, you know, with, with web three, it is, it's actually way more active. It's way more like co-creative um, because it's not just a like click to purchase. It's like, oh, it's a, it's a take an on-chain action, which means that you're going to be paying gas fees. It means you're going to, it's going to be permanently in your wallet. And, and so what does that mean from a relationship standpoint with the people that you're community building with? And so the value proposition you have to offer and the way in which you offer it is just, it just requires way more like finesse and thoughtfulness than, than I think we had in web two, where again, it's like the thing that we're doing is like button colors yeah, and like font size. But in web three, it's more like, Oh, what is it? What are we actually offering people here? And, and is this, is this compelling? Is this what people actually want? Do they want to be a part of this? And actually that's something that like, you know, we, we say at C club all the time is like, don't just build something people want, build something people want to be a part of. And that feels like the real distinction between web two and web three marketing as well. Boom. That's an amazing line. I love that so much. Yeah. So, I mean, so, and then I think this is the perfect transition, right? So I think, well, I don't know. Can we, can we talk about C club and vessel and, and your, you know, your, what you're building now and how do you, how yeah. do you want to talk about it? I guess I'll, I'll start with you and then you tell us and then we can, we can dive into it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, yeah, the, so you're, we're, we're chatting on, we're chatting on June 1st. So this is like, you know, my, my first quote unquote official day is, um, being full-time at Vessel and Broadcast. Very, very exciting. Also very terrifying, like solo non-technical founder right now. Um, but like, also I just feel very supported by the network and like still very much a part of the Seed Club network. Um, and am going to be supporting in, in some various ways too, um, continually, but yeah, Vessel really is born out of identifying a problem space within in working in media at Seed Club and basically realizing, okay, no one's building this. Like, I want to go build this, uh, which I, I feel like is, you know, hopefully like a compelling uh, founder story. But yeah, like, you know, if we think about... A tale is all this so, time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. A tale is all this time. So, you know, if we think about a classic problem in Web 2, you know, there's... 
as a, as a social media manager or as a brand, as a creator, you have to maintain dynamic media strategies across all of these different platforms and they all have to be platform specific strategies. And so creating that content is one thing, but then actually going and publishing and distributing the content is a whole nother thing. And often that last mile is like the most frustrating thing. Right. And like, I definitely felt that as actually going and like posting to Twitter or uploading the newsletter, it's like those kinds of like operational things just, they end up getting pushed so much further down the list because they're way less exciting than like coming up with the story and making the assets themselves. And in web two, like there, there are a handful of social media managers, like a buffer or um, like a Hootsuite or something, but I'll speak for myself. Like I never could maintain usage of those things because they were like terrible to use. Like the UX is just so boring and yeah, just, so I usually ended up just going natively to the apps and, and posting themselves, posting myself that way. Yeah. So it's, it's already chaotic enough to maintain a dynamic media strategy in web two. Now in web three, it's like even more fragmented, right? Because it's, it's, we're, we're decentralized and all of these, these protocols and apps, they're, you know, they're, they maintain their, all their own like standards, um, which is why we're, which is why we're here. We're excited to be in this space, to have ownership over our content and to feel like we're participating in the like creation and proliferation of these, of these apps. Um, and yeah, and, and the ownership piece is really, feels really true. That being said, it's like even more chaotic to maintain a meaningful on-chain media strategy. You're spread across all these different touch points. Um, and you have to go and again, publish natively to all these places. And there are some emerging bundling apps that'll support that. You know, Yuck is a great example and Orb is a great example in the lens ecosystem. But the, the problem still remains that like, there's no way to go and feel like you're interacting with any brands full on-chain media like presence. Even if you look at a place like like a lens or a farcaster, the profiles are they're all the same, right? It's like the only differentiation is like your bio and the content itself. But there's like the thing that I always wanted for C Club was to feel like like I wanted people to come to our media like profiles, whether that was on social or on mirror, uh, and to feel like they were immersed in the C Club ecosystem in a fully branded way. So what Vessel does is basically it's going to do three things. One thing it's going to do is be a multi-platform publisher. So all of the um, you'll, you'll be able to publish to the decentralized protocols through the Vessel dashboard. It'll be syndicated out, but then importantly re-aggregated back to a fully customized front end. So the second thing it'll do is it'll allow brands to build out that fully immersive branded experience for their all of their on-chain media. The vision is that it'll also be able to be linked to a top line domain. So you can imagine like media.cclub.xyz, you would have all of C-Club's on-chain media presented there in a fully branded C-Club way. So like all of their Zora posts, everything that's been on Farcaster or Lens. And then the third thing it'll do is be a social network. So consumers, like I could go, I could build my own profile on Vessel. I'd be able to on-chain follow C-Club and I'd be able to see all of their on-chain media action right in my right in my feed in the way that I would be able to on Twitter or Instagram. I'd be able to see all their tweets or, or their posts. But here, C-Club, because it's an on-chain follow, they'd be able to maintain the interoperability and be able to leave with me if they ever decided to um, leave the Vessel ecosystem. And then there'll also be, hopefully, the vision is the opportunity to have the like, oh, you're going to go launch something on Zora. You can do inline mints in Vessel, right? You don't have to go to Zora itself. You don't have to build your own front-end um, mint site, which is like a whole other barrier. So hopefully further on, like this, this will make it much easier for any creator to come on and like build a full on-chain media presence um, because the, the the tools will just be that much more accessible. That's the big vision for Vessel. Wow. That sounds awesome. So it's like, just so, cause this is my first time hearing about it. I'm sure you and Blake have discussed this like offline. So I'm wrapping my head around it correctly. It's kind of like channel agnostic. As long as it's on-chain, you have complete access and f- you can follow whatever media is out there on chain specifically for any organization, essentially. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like technical things that'll chunk up to that, but yeah, essentially if you are building on chain media, come to Vessel to build out that on-chain media presence um, and have it be contained in a fully branded front end so that, and this is very much a consumer facing product, right? That like, we want to make it easier for brands to present their on-chain media presence. And we want to make it easier for brands and creators to uh, to, to have their community engage with their on-chain media presence. Whereas like right now, consumers and, and fans or audience, they have to go to all the native apps to engage with them in this way through Vessel. They'd be able to do it all in one and feel like they have a holistic sense, a, a less fragmented sense of uh, a brand's on-chain media presence. 
and this is major. Like I'm, I'm really excited about this because I think we want to use this. One thing I would love to kind of drill down on, though, right, is on-chain versus off-chain media, right? Because I think we Let's talk about on-chain it. media. We'll love yeah. to get, would love to get your take on number one, and I think we had talked about this at broadcast a couple of weeks ago, which is uh, it is still fairly a nascent space with on-chain media. So we'll love to get your hot take on how you think about those two different areas of while, yes, Lens and, and Farcaster and all these other things need to be aggregated or like, you know, just making that distribution easier for creators is very important. The reality is the reason, you know, C Club was on Twitter and we're on Twitter and everyone else is on Twitter is right now, like that's where the distribution point is. So how do you kind of like map those two worlds together? Yeah. I mean, what a juicy question. And I think Chase Chapman, I think she came out with this hot take that was like, yeah, Web3 is just like never going to outpace like Web2 distribution. And I think that that's true in the current state. I think that as brands building on-chain media presences, like we're still going to utilize Web2 as our distribution platform for, especially for audience building, right? So like broadcast and vessel, like we're, I just like had to stand up Twitter accounts for those, (laughs) for those, those entities. And like how frustrating to then have to like, like cold start another Twitter account. But to that point, it's like, yeah, there's still web two is still a critical place for audience building. I think our on-chain media presence, and especially the way that we're thinking about it at Vessel is like, Vessel is a place and and on-chain media is a place to really build out your community and like your, your quote unquote true believers. Like there's a very big difference between, you know, vanity metrics on Twitter that it's just like, farming likes versus like having someone actually go and mint the thing. And so that to me is the, is the distinction. And, and I feel excited for us to experiment and play with both. I think we'll, I think at different times for even within a brand itself, like you'll probably dial, you know, your, your on-chain media presence at some points. And some, sometimes you'll dial your web two media presence on other points. And to me, it's that like integration of optionality into, um, into our marketing and media strategies that feels so exciting. Yeah. And that, and that makes So much sense, right? And I think this maps back to what you were talking about earlier with the difference between audience and community. Just recapping for myself and for everyone else is I guess what we're talking about here is like Twitter and the Web2 platforms, they still make sense for distribution, but really the value that on-chain media like you're talking about brings is allowing the the brands to really build that engagement, to build that community and allow people to co-create together. So actually with that being said, we'd love to get a better understanding of like when we talk about on-chain media, like let's get specific. Like what are the kind of like platforms that you're most excited about as spicy as you want to get right like is do we think mirror is awesome do we think it's shit do we think lens is awesome how do you think about uh on chain media today and maybe even like what's missing mm-hmm. yeah the, uh, yeah so what am i excited about i mean lens i think is a really incredible ecosystem like also that growth team is like just there's so much to learn from that from that growth team. Um, Claire, Christina, and Bradley, like really incredible humans. Farcaster, I think, is a is a fascinating place. The thing I'm watching, and I feel I don't want to come out with like a full thesis on it because I, I I'm I don't know. Like here's a, a study I made up for the for this conversation, but I feel like I'm watching different like demographics or audiences or communities like coalesce around different social networks, like. I don't feel as like comfortable on Farcaster, so to say, um, even though I think it's a really important like quick post tool. I couldn't really tell you why, but um, yeah, Lens, I mean, Lens again, just like super, super excited, super bullish on Lens. Yeah, Mirror, I mean, Dennis is an incredible builder. I think it's really amazing how much they've been first movers in the Web3 publishing space, like with writing NFTs, even Mint to subscribe, like they kind of were like early on open editions, even before uh, Zora was. I think one of the things I feel interested with Mirror is like, if the intention is to have people go build digital, like publishing footprints on Mirror, like, you know, broadcast right now, our, the magazine is, is hosted on Mirror. I think that there does need to be a bit more either customization on the, the front end is, or like to open up the API to be able to plug it in to a, to a bespoke front end for a brand. You know, I think Zora has done an incredible job in opening up their API in that way. Like, for C Club, for our eyewitness collection, we did it all on Zora, but we're able to plug it into the C Club front end. And so it still felt like a C Club native minting experience for folks. And again, that's like where I see Vessel coming in. It's like not everyone is going to have the resources to build out.
about a customized front end, right? A vessel could be the place where if like I wanted to just like throw up a fun open edition or like a series of open editions, but I wanted to have a native crypto honey or stuff experience, like I would be able to do it on vessel, like through like some sort of drag and drop simple customization thing rather than having to build it out myself. I also feel really excited for on-chain video. You know, obviously Live Peer was a presenting sponsor at Broadcast and we recorded what were called sets. Blake and Simon did a fabulous one together. And we're right now looking at the raw footage and we're we're doing all of our posts and we're thinking about, okay, what is our on-chain video strategy here? And that still feels like a huge design space. Like we're, you know, me and LDF and Shannon and, and the Live Peer team, like we, we're, we just feel like we're out, like, okay, we're like building this as we're going. And so I, I feel really excited for how we uh, engage with, with on-chain video and like verifiability and all those like non-sexy words that are actually still pretty important. I guess that, that's how I, that's how I'd answer that question. Blake. That's winning. I guess one thing that I just wanted to ask going back to, you know, the fact that those, the web two platforms or channels like Twitter are better for distribution or just building out awareness as I like to think of like top of funnel sort of stuff. Whereas obviously when you start to get onto like on-chain, you know, behaviors or engagement, I feel like there's higher intent there and you're moving down the funnel and, and that, that's where, you know, Vessel and, and just any sort of like Web3 on-chain platform comes in. But yeah, I always just like to think about like the bridge, right? And like what the next few years are going to th- are gonna look like for some of these legacy Web2 quote unquote brands. Like where is this all headed within like the next de- decade um, with on-chain media? Like how do we believe existing media orgs will adopt Web3 um, and make that transition over from using, you know, the current Web2 distro where the audience is channels to kind of utilizing more of these Web3 on-chain platforms um, that we were just discussing and naming. And then even down to Vessel where it's all kind of aggregated right into one place. Like, how do we see that playing out over the next few years? Do you have any theories? I mean, gosh, if I feel like if I had an answer to that question, I'd be an incredible investor. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, yeah. What, what do I, what do I actually think here? Um, I, I feel like we're, we're already, we're already sort of seeing it happen in real time, right? That we're coming out of 2021 was like year of like big, big NFT year. And then 2022 was like big Dow year. And then 2023, we're talking about consumer. And I think what we're, what we're seeing even in just the last year and a half is like, we went from a full unbundle and now what we're seeing is like a kind of a bit of a slow rebundle, which makes a lot of sense, right? That like, it's, it's, it's a little, it's hard to ask the average consumer to engage with on-chain media right now. You know, like even me just trying to onboard a hand, handful of my friends, it's like, it takes like days <laughs> because like, you know, mobile that like download the mobile wallet and then like, oh, it's just like not working in browser. Okay. Do you have your computer? Okay. Like it just... It, it, and then, and then, okay, if it, if is it even on mainnet, then you have to like you have to switch networks. Do you have you know? Okay, you got a bridge. It's just it's the whole, and like people are like, what does mint mean actually? Is it like published? And I'm like, yeah, sort of. It's like a new thing. Um, so yeah, I think ten years. It's like so hard to predict. I think I think like two years out from now, I don't think we're gonna obscure the crypto native functions necessarily, but I think that we will figure out just like more delightful UX. Like, I don't even think easier UX is a good way to say it, but just like, it's just going to like be like more aesthetic and like more playful and like more exciting for people to participate and not like, you know, ether scan. <laughs> um, like I was showing, I was like trying to explain transactions. I was like, it's all based on transactions. And I like pulled up ether scan for a friend of mine who's like full non crypto native. And he was just like, what am I looking at? And I'm like, you're looking at a database uh, <laughs> and it lives in the cloud. <laughs> and this is a, this is a, this is called the block explorer. So yeah, I think I, think that like those things will not necessarily be obscured, but just like be made more like pretty. That's one of my predictions. It's it's not just a prediction. I'm like, I hope that for us, I would love that for us. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Beautifying the UX a little bit or UI, I guess I should say. I think so many people have been focused on like web three infra, infra, infra. And like, and so everyone's just building infrastructure, but it's like, People don't know how to use that. Like, or, or like until you have the fun consumer apps that people actually want to use, the delightful experiences, what's the point in building all this other stuff? It's kind of like with UX, user experience, how do we think, how do we make the experience 
more delightful, right? And then like with the Block Explorer, I think people are now coming out with, I forget the names, but there are like two or three of these, right? Where they mm -hmm. just like, they translate the ether scan into digestible human language. <laughs> so instead exactly. of me having to read, oh, from yeah. OX blah, 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 to this OX with this, and it's just like, no, it just means this person sent this money here yeah. for this much money, you know, like yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So just to like give a, give a shout out to a, a web two company. So, uh, the browser company arc, I think like whew, what they're building, I, I think we have so much to learn in crypto from, from arc. I think first of all, the fact that they have built a browser, like when's the last time that we had a browser as a product, right? Talk about taking something that could just be seen as infrastructure and turning it into a delightful consumer experience. Like I am so long on arc, like I can never go back. Yeah. And like the, they just, they just like rolled out boosts. Like they're, they're, there's so much customizable components to arc as a browser, like has really made me rethink the browser as an opportunity. And so I, I, I hope that like in crypto, we can learn from, <laughs> from arc and the, the browser company team like big shout out for what they have done in the last year yeah arc is crushing it and it's a funny thing too because crushing it's it. um it feels like they're quote unquote web two but they're like innovating in, in like really cool ways and it's like we yeah. call ourselves web three but when you talk about the ux and functionality it's like we're back in 1990 something right so it's kind of like we're Literally. futuristic but we're really primitive at the same time. Retro futuristic. <laughs> so, retro yeah. future. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. I could go on for days about this as a non-technical person. It's just incredibly frustrating. I don't know how any of this, I mean, we talk about it virtually in every episode and I'm sure you did as well in the C club, um, you know, or just did as well in the C club podcast, but yeah, drastic changes. Um, what's the quote? Like you eat with your eyes. Right. But on mm. top of that, just the actual experience, right? Like, visuals is like one and then the experience ease of experience um is another thing so i think like we're all in agreement here that like that is the huge hurdle that web3 has <laughs> that to get it to that next phase of mass adoption as blake says heard we're but all cool. it. <laughs> yeah we're all building it. it yeah yeah <laughs> So just to wrap things up, because I know we're running short on time, I would love to hear the game plan and roadmap for Vessel. When can we expect to see more incredible things from yourself and, and the team, I guess, that you're building out as you guys embark on this new journey? Honestly, the most forward-facing thing that Vessel is doing right now is actually broadcast. We're going to do another pop-up event at Shelling Point at ETCC. Super stoked to partner with Gitcoin on that. And we're going to, yeah, we've got we've got another maybe flagship summit that will run in the fall somewhere. But yeah, that 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 feels like the most forward facing thing we're doing. And of course we're going to run the digital magazine as well for broadcast. But yeah, for Vessel right now, you know, it's just basically trying to get to MVP as quickly as possible so that we can, you know, start to, to, to prove out like is what, what, what is possible with the existing tech right now? What are the things that we have to build ourselves? The hope is that we can just build on top of existing things, but you never know uh, as you, as you actually start to build. So yeah, I mean, my hope is that like in the fall, we'll have some, some things for, for my and the team to click around on and yeah, keep an eye out for, for broadcast for more from broadcast for sure. There we go. And actually, I realized we've talked about broadcast a lot. Did we actually describe what it is? I don't what know. What broadcast is? No, oh, no, please tell me. Broadcast is a was uh, we, the first summit in NY in New York City um, on May nineteenth, uh, and it was like the inaugural Web three Media Summit. It's like blows my mind that there hadn't been one in the space yet. So super cozy event. About seventy folks came through: founders, builders, creators, investors. Of course, the Myosin team was there, and yeah, just had like cozy conversations around. Eight different topics on both production and proliferation in media. So marketing, IP, uh, monetization, on-chain zines, luxury media came up, of course, and interoperability infrastructure. And yeah, it was it was hugely successful. I think people found the conversations really insightful and really inspiring. And yeah, we're going to, we're, we're taking the show on the road. Broadcast was a, a production, uh, it was presented by LivePeer, uh, which is on-chain video infrastructure, super incredible company and incredible team. Vessel and Foster were the producers on it. And then we had big support from Jihad at Forefront and then Rafa, who's from Folklore and currently Summer of Protocol. So really like all-star team working on it. And yeah, we're going to do uh, pop-up activations, like little pop-up summits at other crypto conferences. And then we're going to make sure that we host uh, at least one, but most likely two of those flagship summits a year. And then we're going to pull all of the insights into Broadcast Magazine. Uh, so that'll sort of be the digital persistent container for the insights that happen at the summits. But then Broadcast Magazine will also just 
just be like kind of the digital home for the future of on-chain media. So not just limited to things that happen at the summits themselves, but just like as ideas and products and founders emerge in the space, um, broadcast will be the place where they'll live, they'll live on. That's going to be so much fun. Uh, yes. I'm really excited yeah, for that. Yeah, sounds I think awesome. Th- there's a lot of really cool stuff that is just now starting to, I think, like take over in terms of like media, in terms of NFTs and communities and how they come to life and how they market. And, you know, we always talk about community in Web3. It's the hot, it's the buzzword we talk about every day. It's the it's the C word, as we say. And, um, <laughs> But I think we, we're still we're still early, right? So I think there's just such we're cool so experimentation early. coming down the line. It's yeah. going to be great. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. So just to wrap things up, let's jump into rapid fire questions. So we do this with every guest. It's almost all, it is basically the same format every time. But I, I always love hearing different responses from different people just to see, you know, what, what comes out. So I'll kick things off with Web3 Project, not including your own. So it can't be C Club Vessel or Broadcast and all that. Uh, mm-hmm. That you're most bullish on. What what really gets you excited and, and pumped? Boys Club, <laughs> very easy. <laughs> um, yeah, I think <laughs> Boys Club is just like just such an incredible community. Um, yeah, Dean and Natasha, co-founders, are just like the most like wise, smart, funny, like hella dedicated builders that like I honestly have ever met. Super high insight community. If anyone is unfamiliar with Boys Club, like go to Twitter, Boys Club, at Boys Club World, get yourself in the Discord, like go to an event. It's really, really the place to be. I'm so bullish on them. There we go. And that's actually just quick like side tangent, but related. Uh, that's how I found Julie. That's how we got connected in the first place was uh, I told my girlfriend about Boys Club. She joined. And then when we needed someone like Julie, I, I was like, Hey, like, can you go po- post this in Boys Club Discord? And like, I was just asking, and then that's how Julia, my girlfriend, and then we got introed, and then boom, like, so there we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the it's the way. Yeah, I'm on their Discord like daily, just saying my GMs, checking the skincare channel, like travel, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they are my. I credit them for, I guess, what is it, red pilling me? I don't know, like my gateway yeah. into Web three. Um, yeah, it starts with skincare, then wallets. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, 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 actually, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, in my case, he met Masha, which I'm pretty sure you probably know, mm-hmm. um, at an event. And then she told him about Boys Club. Same thing, Blake. He came home, told me about uh, it. I went go. on boysclub.vip, <laughs> and the rest is history. Yeah. <laughs> the rest is history. It's all the boyfriends yeah. being like, yeah, like, go, go join this thing. Because <laughs> it's like, and I it was like it. a point of frustration for him because he had spent, like, no lie, like three years trying trying to get me into crypto and it just takes a community like boys club relatable. There we go. Awesome. Yeah. Speaking of UX, I mean, I know they redid their website yeah. recently, but before they had like their lessons broken out and like, that was just like, okay, like this yeah. is manageable for me, you know, as someone who like has no idea, doesn't even know what she doesn't know. So yeah, a, an agreement there. You're, you're cool. telling me ladies don't want to join NFT projects like crypto dick butts and uh, other <laughs> highly reputable organizations. Well, they're not mutually exclusive, so. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Boys Club is my first love, but I also do love a crypto dick butt. <laughs> they are pretty fun. They're pretty fun. <laughs> um, just moving on to the second one. So um, biggest professional learning over the past 12 months or so. Uh, leadership is hard. Leadership is messy. And maybe that's like not a new learning, but I think it was just like, it's just like humbling to be reminded of that. And that everything is relationships. No wrong answer. Everything is relationships. Like, yeah, like it's both like up, down, across, all around the stack. It's like, everything is about relationships. Yeah. It's like a constant reminder that those things are the most important things in the space. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I think it's true, right? We have a tendency to reinvent the wheel. And I think it really just comes from the fact that like, we have this idea of, oh, like you can decentralize and there, you don't need leadership or ever, we can all lead together. And in theory, yes, like there are really cool ways to kind of create consensus and governance using tokens and economics and all that. But the reality is all those things are built on trust, right? And Mm -hmm. to build that trust, you can't do that overnight. And to build that trust and get to that point of decentralization, we need leadership. And like you said, leadership is hard. Leadership is messy and it requires working with people on a day-to-day basis. And yeah. So I don't know, just echoing that because it, it, it very much resonates. I, I hear you yeah. there. Next question here. So someone airdrops you a million dollars into your wallet. Uh, it could be USCC. It could be into your checking account as fiat. Uh, you can't touch anything again related to what you're doing today. 
what would you go build? I would build like like physical gathering spaces uh, for like all the all the like web free homies. Um, like having been at broadcast um, and just like every time that I'm in person for a conference, I'm just like, oh, this is the way. Like, really, just need to be in person more. So I would put that million dollars like into into ways to get us all like in person, face to face more often. Cabin, cabin is also building this. Network City. That's what I was going to say. I was like, that's basically yeah. what Cabin's built. In. It's Cabin. So you it's just invested cabin. in Cabin. Love you, John. Yeah. <laughs> invested or- in Cabin. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm into it. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You just put that money, you just buy a couple properties, put it on the Cabin network, and boom, you're good. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. What are your craziest predictions in Web3 by mm. end of this year? I don't know. I think we're having like a big L2 year. I think that like 2023 is like the year of layer twos. Um, so I don't know, like who else is going to, who else is going to ship one? I think that's a, that, that feels really exciting. I think FWB Fest is going to be, going to be wild. Maybe that's not a super crazy prediction, but I'm stoked for that. Yeah. Big, big layer two, big layer two summer. That's my guess. I'm into it. What are the L2s <laughs> that you're uh, most excited about? I mean, just Zora, come on. on. <laughs> <laughs> like, Zora, that team just ships, like, so good. Yeah, I, I just, I'm also, like, you know, ga- the, the way that gas fees have just been, like, network fees have just been so high lately. I'm just, like, all about, yeah, pulling as much as we can onto layer two. Makes sense. Makes sense. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's it. So, I, and then the very last thing, actually, and we always leave some space for the guest, is... Show yourself, right? Tell the world <laughs> where can they find you, vessel, broadcast, all that. Also, wait, real quick, how do you define luxury on chain media? We didn't, we didn't actually oh get to my ask gosh. that question. Luxury yeah. on chain media, yeah. Um, so, luxury on chain media. I mean, luxury media as a, as a as a full stop is just you know it's 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 media that is like fully anti utility, right? So it's fully speaking toward like an aspirational identity. Like I think Boys Club has really nailed the idea of luxury media. Um, and I think luxury media can be both exclusive, but also like free for anyone to consume, right? Like Boys Club, you can you can go and consume that media, and yet it still feel has a sense of exclusivity because it's like speaking to a certain aspirational identity. So that's yeah, and, and of course like on chain luxury media, that's that's exactly what it is. It's it's what is it's media that um, is fully on chain that is supporting some some sense of self, some again aspirational identity that we're all we're all aspiring to. But yeah, I mean, show myself. I feel like this entire podcast has been a shell. So um, yeah, I, I just like I'm so <laughs> thankful that you yeah that you you asked me to come spend this hour with you. Um, I'm going to give you my, my web two distribution handles. Um, cause I can point you to all the other places, uh, on chain where we are. So I'm personally on Twitter at, uh, crypto honey, which is crypto H U N three Y broadcast is at broadcast at babe on Twitter. And then vessel is on vessel underscore world, but you can find, you can find all those places, um, from my, from my Twitter account too. And C club definitely go give C club some love at C club HQ. There we go. We love C Club. We love uh, we love Steph. We love Vessel. We love Broadcast. We love it all. So thanks so much for coming on. This was a really great chat. Want to talk more about on chain media, but we'll we'll have more opportunities. I'm sure in the future. Maybe we'll do a follow up once Vessel's live. We get uh, we it. Can put it on chain. We'll do the whole thing. It'll be fun. Put it on chain. There yeah. Nice meeting you. Thanks for the chat. Good luck with everything. Put it on thanks, chain. Thanks, Julie. Coming soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. And uh, talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of W3G. If you'd like to learn more about Web3 marketing, please visit myson.xyz to get started. And of course, if you're a fan of the show, please be sure to show us your support by subscribing and leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, or whatever platform you're using to tune in. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. 